Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day for a change. Isn't it about to be this kind of spring weather? I'm telling you, it's enough rain for now. Uh, well, I am Jeff Peckerel, and I am from the Forum and the Human Rights Working Group here at UUSF. And uh, you've attending uh, our latest forum. This is a long running series that's been produced at the church here. And uh, today we're going to have a really good presentation by Professor Zunas from uh, San Francisco State. He's joining us. Actually, from University of San Francisco. University of San Francisco. Thank you. I'm mistaken about that. And uh, we have other forums I just want to mention. Uh, in coming weeks, we will have a very interesting session on book bans and how. People can be working to stop those. It's a growing trend around the country. And we have a library commissioner from uh, Sonoma County coming down to speak with us in person on the 30th. I think, sorry, no, the 23rd of April. And then on the 30th of April, Tim Redmond of the Answer Coalition will be here uh, to speak about the anti-war movement, essentially, and further sessions beyond that. So stay tuned for those. Uh, I want to mention that uh, for those of you who are here today, if you haven't already gotten breakfast, it's available over here. And Melvin Starks has been producing that for us as he always does every week, and which is really fantastic. And before we turn the stage over to Professor Zunas, I'd like to have Dolores Perez Heilbronn give the Ohlone land recognition. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We, the members of the First Unitarian Universal Society of San Francisco, acknowledge that our community is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Raimatush Ohlone tribes, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working here, and we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples. The Greater Bay Area is also the ancestral territory of the Miwok, Yokuts, Patwin, and other tribes. As the original stewards of this land, the indigenous peoples understood the interconnectedness of all things and maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor them now for their enduring commitment to our Mother Earth. Thank you. All right. And with that, we will have Professor Zunas now speak to us about Israel and Palestine and the current situation, new developments there. So please take it away, Professor Zunas. Well, thank you so much. Um, great to be with you all today. Um, I just want to start by um, observing that um, Israel has, has essentially been taken over by their equivalent of the Trump DeSantis wing of the Republican Party. Uh, we are talking about a hard right uh, coalition of um, powerful right wing interests, including religious fundamentalists um, who uh, do not, uh, frankly, believe in democracy, um, uh, those who are overtly racist. Um, and this is a very different Israel than many people of my generation are grew up knowing that, I mean, there are certainly contradictions from the outset um, in terms of uh, Israel's uh, treatment of the Palestinians, uh, but, you know, it was a, a social democracy. I mean, this was a country that was sort of a Sweden of the Middle East and, um, you know, these grassroots socialist institutions like the kibbutzim, um, as strange as it sounds now, um, you know, in, on college campuses, Israel is considered cool, cool. You know, even non-Jews would volunteer to work in kibbutzim. It was it was seen as a um, a, 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 a aggressive uh, kind of a country. Uh, again, even though it was established on stolen land, uh, as has our as as is our country, um, there were. Um, you know, positive things you could you could say about it, but um, you know, the uh, right now it is uh, uh, un under this far right uh, rule. Uh, they uh, being a parliamentary system, basically the executive and the uh, legislative are, are essentially act as one. Uh, the um, and they're trying to take over the Supreme Court to to, to throw out any kind of a, a balance of, of powers, no separation of powers. Part of this is to, by Netanyahu's effort to prevent going to jail, 
um, after uh, being charged with many uh, crimes, uh, corruption, bri bribery, and extortion, a bunch of things like that. Um, you know, new laws have been passed uh, explicitly to protect them. Uh, there are uh, new laws basically uh, making it easier for the Israelis to seize Palestinian land, both within Israel and in the occupied uh, territories. Uh, there is a um, new militia uh, that is being established uh, that uh, under the control of a far-right racist uh, you know, minister who's called for uh, physically destroying Palestinian towns. Um, if, you know, um, this is, um, we've seen in recent uh, months how these far-right settler militias with apparently cooperation with the Israeli government have been uh, you know, uh, burning uh, uh, vineyards, destroying orchards. Uh, they went into a town called Huara, you know, uh, destroyed dozens of, of, of cars and homes and, um, and you know, killed a man. Um, this is... Um, um, Unfortunately, the shift is, I think, going to be a permanent thing. I mean, just the demographics are such that uh, the more secular liberal um, Israelis tend to have small families. A lot of their adult children are emigrating to Europe because it's, things are getting so so right-wing and extreme, uh, whereas the more religious and nationalist um, Israelis are having large families. And again, in a small country like Israel, the demographics are such that it doesn't uh, take long to... Um, take over. <laughs> um, this wing of Israeli politics, I mentioned, is very closely allied to Trump. I mean, Trump appointed key people in, uh, in Israeli-Palestinian issues that are opposed Palestinian statehood, uh, that believe Israel should control all the land, uh, essentially. Um, and um, under his uh, leadership, uh, the U.S. became the only country to move its embassy to uh, 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 Jerusalem, which is a, um, a multi-ethnic, uh, uh, multi-religious city that uh, the U.S. insists should be, all be part of Israel. It's, we're the only country in the world that's recognized Israel's illegal annexation of the Golan region of Syria, which Israel seized in 1967. Uh, um, um, under Trump, the U.S. formally recognized Israeli settlements in the occupied West Banks as part of Israel's sovereign territory. Again, the only country to do that. And he pu pushed, um, uh, and and, but you know Biden is in foreign policy, in, in charge of foreign policy now. Um, and but um, so so where's so I want to focus more on where Biden's coming from. But th what's striking is he hasn't really changed uh, many of Trump's policies. We still have the U.S. embassy in um, in Jerusalem. Indeed, uh, Biden uh, co-authored the original Senate bill. Uh, back uh, that made that uh, made that move uh, move legal. Um, he's not reversed uh, U.S. recognition of the uh, occupation of Golan. U.S. government maps show the Golan region of Syria as part of Israel. No no demarcation in, in, to um, note that it's uh, occupied territory. This is in direct contravention to a series of U.N. Security Council resolutions, including what those supported by Ronald Reagan. That made clear that Israel's annexation was null and void. No country can expand its territory by force. That's what we're talking about with Ukraine. But according to Biden, um, well, if it's an ally like Israel, then then it's um, <laughs> then it's okay. Um, the um, I mean, if we look at the um, uh, Democratic Party platform from 2020, um, well, the Republicans, you know, went as far as saying, uh, you know, that we reject the myth that Israel's an occupier. You know, they oppose Palestinian statehood. Um, the Democratic uh, platform isn't a whole lot better. Um, they reject the the the, uh, the Biden's people who dominated the platform writing committee rejected calls by moderate for Israel groups like J Street to criticize the occupation by name. Instead, uh, Biden's folks side with right wing pro Israel groups like APAC and didn't even mention the occupation. There's no mention of the occupation in the Democratic platform. It doesn't offer any criticisms regarding the network of more than 250 illegal settlements Israel has established in the West Bank and other occupied territories in violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, a series of UN Security Council resolutions, and a landmark ruling of the International Court of Justice. The um, Democratic platform did, however, criticize international civil society campaigns to boycott companies and other entities supporting the occupation and settlements. 
Um, uh, the platform rejected calls by Warren and Sanders delegates to support Israel as a state for all citizens, and instead inserted language insisting support for U.S. that U.S. support for Israel is, is as a Jewish, specifically a Jewish state. Now it's interesting that the the opposition of Democrats to the uh, campaign for boycotts, investment, and sanctions is is, is rather striking, since only fifteen percent of Democrats familiar with the BDS campaign oppose it. Um, close to 90% of Democrat, Democrats believe the United States should be either favor the Palestinians or take a more neutral stance in the peace process. Yet the Democratic Party is you know, really uh, is, is very strongly supporting the Israeli government. Another poll shows actually, it came out a few weeks ago, that said more Democrats have sympathy for Palestinians than they do the Israelis. But again, there's a big disconnect between the rank and file, the Democratic Party, and its uh, leadership. It's um, both in Congress and in the um, administration. Um, polls, uh, the, 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 the Democratic Party officially says Israel should remain a Jewish state. 81% of Democrats favor Israel's democracy more than its Jewishness. In other words, believing that should a two-state solution no longer be possible as a result of the continued Israeli colonization of the West Bank, which many people believe is already the case, they would support a single democratic state in which Arabs and Jews are equal, even if it means that Israel will no longer politically be a Jewish state. But according to the democratic leadership, that's saying you want to destroy Israel and it's, and it's, it's condemned. 75% um, of Democrats believe military aid to Israel, like any country, should be conditional on human rights and international law. Among young Democrats, it's like 90 percent. But the Democratic platform calls for spending up to, uh, up to $38 billion in un unconditional military aid to Israel in the coming years. Indeed, during the primaries, when Warren and Sanders and Buttigieg call on conditioning aid to Israel, um, Biden condemned it as bizarre and compared it to kicking France out of NATO. Um, so what, where, where is Biden coming from? Well, he does say he's for a two-state solution, but he's pressing for more countries to recognize Israel while actively discouraging countries from recognizing Palestine. In fact, his position as the United States will withhold any funding for any UN agency that has Palestine as a member. He's also praised Trump's Abraham Accords uh, even though 80% of Middle East scholars believe it's actually set back a piece in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords, basically, is we got uh, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, these two small Arab dictatorships to recognize Israel in exchange for massive arms shipments. We, we, we forced Sudan to normalize relationship with, with Israel, saying we continue uh, as the only means of lifting sanctions against uh, that country. And similarly, the U.S. ended up uh, getting Morocco to recognize Israel and return to the United States, recognizing Morocco's illegal annexation of Western Sahara, which is a full member state of the African Union, recognized by more than 80 countries as one of the more democratic uh, governments in Africa. But uh, Morocco currently occupies about 80 percent of the um, of the territory, again, in violation of UN Security Council resolutions, World Court ruling and and and, and others. Other examples of double standards, Biden has repeatedly condemned Palestinian attacks on Israeli civilians, but he's defended Israeli attacks against Palestinian civilians in Gaza and elsewhere, saying it's it's self-defense. Self um, the, um, the Biden administration defended the United Nations role in establishing uh, the state of Israel back in 1948, but it opposes any UN role in establishing a Palestinian state. Um, Biden insists that Israel should hold, control at least 78% of historic Palestine, that is the territory within its internationally recognized borders, but insists that Palestinian demands for the remaining 22% are too much, and they need to compromise more. <laughs> um, another example of the double standards, the Biden administration has no object, uh, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, it still supports the Israeli government, even though their prime minister and the majority of their cabinet oppose Palestine's right to exist, but it says that if even a single member of the Palestine Authority cabinet refuses to recognize Israel, we would cut off all relations with the uh, Palestinian uh, government. Um, the um, 
uh, Biden administration has attacked Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and other groups uh, which have documented um, uh, violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law by the Israeli government. Um, we um, uh, they, they, they've, they've opposed the International Criminal Court uh, investigating war crimes by both Israel and Hamas um, uh, because it would include Israel. <laughs> Um, uh, indeed, when uh, uh, Congresswoman Ilan Omar has said that the UN should, um, uh, you know, the ICC should, you know, check out war crimes, whether it be Israel or Hamas or the United States or the Taliban or whatever, uh, Democratic leaders condemned her for saying that saying the ICC should investigate Israel foments prejudice and undermines progress towards peace and security for all. And then she was using uh, it was indicative of deep-seated prejudice on her part, and, and she was giving cover to um, to terrorist groups. Um, the, um, uh, the more examples of the double standard: we uh, we invaded Iraq supposedly because they had a nuclear uh, weapons program. Um, uh, Biden has made clear that we'd be willing to attack Iran, go to war with Iran if they if they. If they ended up getting even a single nuclear weapon, yet the United States has not only shown no objections to the more than 200 nuclear weapons that Israel has, the Biden administration has refused to even acknowledge they have them uh, because it would threaten the billions of dollars of, of aid that we uh, we um, we provide. And again, this is not just Biden; other members of the administration. I mean, for example, uh, 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 Kamala Harris, um, uh, now the vice president, her first vote. Uh, as a first foreign policy vote as a senator back in January of 2017, she sided with Trump uh, in criticizing outgoing President Obama's refusal to veto an over otherwise unanimous, very modest, and largely symbolic UN Security Council resolution opposing Israeli settlements. Um, and um, she attacked her res the resolution she supported, attacked the United Nations. Um, who are weighing in on questions of international humanitarian law in the territories, um, and, um, and and insisted that uh, it was it was one sided uh, to oppose violence on both sides and to call for both parties to to to, to negotiate a settlement based on uh, um, on international law. But she she sided with Mitch McConnell and uh, Kevin McCarthy against Dianne Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi. I mean, you know, so Kamala Harris is very much on the right. When it comes to um, a foreign uh, policy, uh, basically she, um, um, you know, you know, says that uh, uh, efforts by the UN to press Israel to um, live up to international legal standards or efforts to de delegitimize um, um, uh, Israel. Um, similarly. Um, the um, Chuck Schumer, the um, um, a Democratic um, leader, uh, and the um, um, uh, the House uh, uh, Democratic uh, leader um, have um, um, you know, Hakeem Jeffries have both aligned themselves very strongly with Netanyahu. And you know have have opposed uh, uh, moderate uh, Zionists like the people in J Street and others who are really pressing for a uh, a, a two state solution. Um, I mean the hard line and, and, and Schumer has come to you know, he, Schumer actually flew to Israel during the big crisis a few weeks ago to, uh, for a photo op with Netanyahu to shore up uh, U.S. support. I mean, right now, I mean, this is if you look at the Democratic leadership in Congress, it's the equivalent of having supporters of the Salvadoran Junta and the Nicaraguan Contras in leadership positions of the Democratic Party in the 1980s. Again, there's no real, you know, both the Democratic and Republican leadership are taking very hardline positions. And I'm g giving you all this just to point out that um, the, um, if you want to know why there's no peace, it's that the United States insists that we are the only outside mediator. The United Nations, the European Union, 
nobody else should get involved. And the U.S. says the only way for peace is for the two sides to work among uh, work it out among themselves. Um, but that ignores the gross, even if you assume that both Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs have a right to statehood, security, all that kind of stuff. It ignores the gross asymmetry in power between the Palestinians under occupation and the Israeli occupiers. We're not saying to Ukraine and Russia, oh, you guys just talk it out among yourselves. Or when Iraq occupied Kuwait, you two just occupy it, you know, talk, you know, talk it out among yourselves and figure out what you need to do. Remember, um, you know, the Israeli government has ruled out categorically any Palestinian state. Um, and, and, and then the U.S. You know, basically says, okay, we, the number one military, economic, and diplomatic supporter of the occupying power, are saying everybody else should butt out, and it, it's up to you, and we will not allow the United Nations. And basically, the Biden administration is the Palestinians cannot take any diplomatic initiatives at the United Nations or anywhere else to recognize their statehood. Biden said that the United States will veto any resolution critical of Israel. And already it's blocked four otherwise unanimous UN Security Council statements. Um, the United States, is uh, Biden is saying the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, should not be involved in any disputes around violations of international humanitarian law by Israel. Um, they, of course, they say no armed struggle by the Palestinians, but they defended Israel when they bombed apartment blocks and major urban areas in, um, in in Gaza and elsewhere. The U.S. also opposes nonviolent actions, such as campaigns for uh, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and they, they say you should just just trust, support the peace process. You know, again, which between two powers, one of which refuses to compromise and basically is holding all the cards as the occupying power. So when the Democrats say we support a two-state solution, do not believe them. Because they are, are are doing everything they can to prevent that from happening by giving unconditional support for Israel, which is categorically ruled out a um, a two state solution. Now I should mention that not all Democrats are taking this position. A couple of years ago, Representative Betty McCollum, she's a Democrat from Minnesota, introduced a bill that would prohibit the United States from providing arms and security assistance to Israel from being used in certain violations of international humanitarian law, um, such as military detention and abuse of children, which is widespread, the demolition of homes, which is widespread, the illegal confiscation of Palestinian property, which is uh, widespread, or the annexation of occupied land. And in response, over a hundred, unfortunately in response to this, over 150 Democratic House members, a clear majority, joined virtually every Republican in, in signing a letter insisting that aid to Israel should remain unconditional, saying that adding conditions such as those would be detrimental to Israel's ability to defend itself, uh, essentially believing, arguing, therefore, that these illegal activities I mentioned constitutes a legitimate uh, self-defense. Um, There's also you know, directly challenging uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and a broad consensus among Middle Eastern scholars that unconditional U.S. military, economic, and diplomatic support for Israel has made that government more intransigent regarding the occupation of Palestinian territory, its ongoing human rights abuses, and, 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 and the more. I mean, this letter was downright Orwellian. It claimed that security aid to Israel is a specific investment in the peace and prosperity of the entire Middle East. You know, um, the thing, and, and they say, again, you should focus on the peace process. But since the collapse of the peace initiative led by Secretary of State Kerry back in 2014, there have been no talks. Um, and you know, so, to say that, again, this has been nine years. And, and saying giving this aid will help... Um, bring the two sides together to talk is doing just uh just the um uh just the opposite um and funny thing about aid though is that um um yeah you know, i've talked to a, a late israeli ma uh, major general former knesset member maddie pellet he talked about 
USA to Israel is more about the profits of American arms manufacturers than meeting Israel's defense needs. Um, and that the, uh, the, the, the aid was, um, um, in many ways, uh, uh, you know, counterproductive, but uh, it, it just encourages the, um, um, again, you know, it encourages their hard line. Um, there's um, the, uh, I should mention that, you know, try, well, when we have problems with the U.S. policy, uh, obviously the way to do is try to try to change things at activism, but there's been a strong uh, effort to try to, to block people from organizing. The California Assembly, State Assembly, passed a resolution ostensibly about uh, combating anti-Semitism, where it said that supporting boycotts, divestment, sanctions of Israel is an anti-Semitic activity that has no place on college campuses. It also claimed that uh, that acknowledging Israel's uh, use of uh, ethnic cleansing or acknowledging that Israel practices a form of apartheid is also an anti-Semitic act. Um, so, you know, e even here in our state, there's an effort to suppress um, dissent. Um, the, um, <clears throat> I mean, let me just mention the amnesty report and, uh, about apartheid, uh, similar to what Human Rights Watch has said, similar to what a number of Israeli groups uh, have documented, but Selim and others, is that there are over a hundred different laws in Israel uh, that may, are, that are separate for Jewish citizens and and, uh, and and the Arab citizens, and in the occupied territories, it's it's even even worse. You have Jewish only settlements, uh, Jewish only roads, separate checkpoints for for Jews uh, and and Arabs. The the Israelis have far greater water rights. Of far rate, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, water rights, and 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 they can expand almost unlimited. Where there's a, a tearing down Palestinian lands, uh, uprooting orchards. I mean, the, the, it, it it really. I've I've been there. I I I balked at the term apartheid for many years, but my last last you know the, a couple of visits there, it really is an apartheid uh, system, and. Um, but, you know, and now now there are 34 states have adopted anti-boycott laws that prevent, that, that punish people for boycotting, what they saw boycotting Israel. But most of these states, they define Israel to mean Israel and territories controlled by Israel. So, for example, if you don't support an academic boycott of Israel, you don't support an absolute boycott of Israel, but you do... Uh, support boycotting uh, Hewlett-Packard and Caterpillar Tractor um, and uh, Motorola and, and some companies that are specifically supporting the occupation settlements, um, then, then you're, you're targeted as well. You cannot have a contract with state government. This Arkansas newspaper was deni uh, denied um, advertising revenue from the community college and other state agencies because they refused to uh, sign a statement saying we will not you know, boycott uh, Israel, the occupied territories, or, or companies that are are supporting that. Uh, we've had a speech pathologist in Texas, a lawyer in in Arizona, and, and uh, a um, math teacher in 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 uh, um, in Kansas have you know lost their state contracts because they refuse to say they won't boycott these companies uh, supporting the uh, occupation. And um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld one of these laws recently. And it's, it's, and it's now opened the door to Texas is banning people from boycotting uh, fossil fuels, uh, gun manufacturers, uh, and the um, and, and and the like. Um, now, I would you know, why all these? Why does US, U.S. take such an extreme position? Um, I would argue it's it's, it's, it's certainly it, it's not the Jewish vote, so called. I mean, Jews have never been more divided about Israel. Um, the, the strongest pro-Israel people in, in Congress are from districts that have very few uh, Jewish uh, voters. Um, the, the three presidents who moved the country most strongly to the right in support of Israel, Nixon, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump, got less Jewish votes than any Republicans in, in modern times, or any, 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 any presidential candidates in, in, uh, in, in, moder uh, in modern times. Um, so it's not about the vote. It's not even about APAC, the pro-Israel lobby. I remember the Biden administration and most congressional Democrats support the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. 
We're the only country in the world that recognizes Morocco's illegal annexation of that of that country. For that, we support Indonesia's occupation of East Timor for a quarter century. And it wasn't a Moroccan American lobby or Indonesian American lobby that's forced us to do that. Unfortunately, the United States is perfectly capable of supporting allied governments invade, occupy, annex, colonize, and suppress their indigenous population without some lobby from an ethnic minority um, forcing us to do it. Um, I mean, basically, this is we're, the the the. the those who support um, the Israeli government are 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 are, are um, don't really care about human rights and international law. That uh, it, you know it it, it is a um, and you know I'm not that's why I don't think we should get into divisive debates about Zionism or whatever because it's not issues in Zionism. It's human rights, international law, just like Iraq, East Timor, Nicaragua, El Salvador. The same issues that divide the Democratic Party in the past. The progressives eventually ended up winning because we made it untenable for Democrats to back Republican foreign policies in these countries. And so I, I really think that um, we need to um, uh, hold uh, uh, Democrats and other liberals um, who should know better accountable on this issue, just as we did around other, other um, um, uh, you know, human rights um, uh, issues. Um, the, uh, I should mention some of the other factors that are pushing this is that um, you have the Christian right who that sees Israel as a manifestation of biblical prophecy and believe Israel controlling everything is necessary for the second coming of Christ. And these folks also believe that when this happens, the Jews will all be condemned to eternal damnation. <laughs> but uh, there's ultimately an anti-Semitic theology, but they're, they need Israel for Act 1, if not Act 2. Um and also you have a thing about older liberals who still kind of hide this idealistic view of Israel, you know, like Paul Newman and Exodus, you know, this very romantic kind of kind of view um, that in many ways is like some leftists who try to rationalize for socialist revolutions that may have gone really authoritarian, really gone off in a negative direction, but they believe in socialism so much they will <laughs> defend some of these governments regardless of them or abandoning their socialist or progressive principles. And similarly, I think we have a lot of liberals who kind of have this blind spot around Israel. It's hard to recognize just how far to the right the country has come and and assume that, you know, you know, there's, you know, the, the world's only Jewish state. Give them a break. You know, don't encourage anti-Semitism by saying anything critical of Israel. You know, so we have so we have these ideological factors at, at work as 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 well. Um, but I think the U.S. support for Israel is primarily a strategic thing that we the Israel the CIA and Mossad cooperate in intelligence gathering covert operations. You get battlefield testing for American uh, uh, weapons. Our, our um, military industrial complexes are greatly intertwined. Um, you know, new jet fighters, anti missile defense systems, et cetera. Israel's funneled arms to third parties the U.S. couldn't give to directly for political reasons. Um, you know, over the years, uh, apartheid South Africa, the Nicaraguan Contras, Guatemalan Junta, more recently, you know, Colombian paramilitaries, Kurdish militia. Um, I mean, as as one Israeli said, you know, the uh, um, Israel's uh, Israel's become just another federal agency when it's convenient to use and you want something done quietly. <laughs> Are you ready for questions, or should I keep talking? <laughs> uh, we have we have a few questions, sure. and and it looks like more people are writing them down. Um, the one question I have here is, um, will new evidence that Netanyahu participated in interfering with U.S. elections causing Trump to be elected change any Democratic attitudes? Well, yeah, they're, 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 uh, the Nation magazine uh, and some others have come out with evidence that the um, Israeli interference um, in the 2016 election was even, even more significant than the Russian interference. And given how incredibly close the election was, you know, just seventy thousand votes in three states would have, uh, you know, shifted things uh, to to uh, to Hillary's side. Uh, that this is indeed uh, uh, significant. And one thing is that because the Netanyahu government has been so overtly pro-Trump, it's giving a little uh, political space for Democrats, some Democrats, to to to, to give something of a. Um, a take something of a distance from Israeli policies. I mean, it's ironic for Netanyahu who says, we will not let, uh, when Biden has done a little finger wagging about the uh, the judicial coup, um, that, um, you know, that he says, he's now saying, you know, 
uh, you know, Israel, U.S. should not intervene in, in Israel's internal affairs when, of course, not only was the 2016 uh, interference uh, uh, problematic, but Biden actually, or, or Trump, uh, remember, Netanyahu came while, without the uh, invitation of President Obama to, do, to talk to a joint section of, 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 of Congress to attack Obama and the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, talk about foreign in intervention. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's giving a little bit of a political, uh, a, little, a little bit of political space for people to be more critical of Netanyahu. Though, uh, in certain ways, I think it's important to recognize that Netanyahu, I think, is a symptom of a broader, broader problem. That when you are an occupying power, you know, for um, yes, um, you know, fifty-five years, um, that it does something to one's psyche it does uh, it, 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 it it it's what brings this authoritarian mindset if you can justify denying people their basic human rights including their right of self-determination uh you know it, it's not a big leap to want to to limit these kind of rights for young people as well i'm mary jane i have in 19 i mean in 2004 i went to an international biannual art fest and there they had two television sets. And I said, how can two television sets be part of an art program? One television set was for uh, Jews going from one place A to point B, and the other one was for non-Jews. And I think of people from Westbeck going from that same area. And it took, they said, how long did it take? So one could go on freeways that roads that uh, the Arabs could not use. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2004 yeah. that we are talking about treatment where you cannot use the public highways mm -hmm. in Israel to go from one end to the other. And part of the roadways died off. It's think about us going from it's such a small country, but going any distance, the same distance, but you have to take the dirt roads and back roads mm -hmm. and even go through checkpoints on your own roads. Mm -hmm. And it was such a shock to me. And I don't see any information to the public in the United States about how there is a difference. We had laws that Blacks had to be home before the sundown. But this is worse than that. And there's no discussion of that. Yeah, this and information is publicly available, you know, in, in uh, many new, in, in many news reports and, of course, in human rights organizations reports, anybody who's actually been there. And yet, you know, I remember the, uh, um, you know, what was it, the uh, uh, another recent democratic platform, you know, praised Israel as being a model, you know, for um, uh, democracy and, and, and to tolerance and pluralism. I mean, there is this real, real denial of the reality um, you know, going on there. And uh, yeah, this is, it is, it is, uh, I mean, there, there are plenty of, I mean, there are plenty of governments in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world that violate human rights, but, you know, one that does so kind of based on an ethnic racial lines, I mean, that, that does make things, I think, uh, put, put things to a different level. And again, why they're, why, it, why it's uh, uh, the practice is being called apartheid. Well, that's what they're saying, that Israel is the the wonderful democratic place in the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, what, frankly, why I think a lot of uh, uh, Israel supporters like Biden are really freaking out about the uh, this judicial coup that Netanyahu was happening. Because if, he, if he'd gotten away with that, as he still might, and some of these other things, it'll be hard for Israel to say Israel's a democracy anymore. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the opposition has to do with PR. I mean, the U.S. supports plenty of outright dictatorships that have no judicial independence. I mean, you know, we, we send all these arms and aid to Egypt, for example. We, we send arms to, to um, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, all these other repressive regimes. They, and, you know, they don't have an independent judiciary. So it's not like we're upset about Israel losing its independent judiciary per se. We're we're upset about it. It, it will make it more difficult to justify military support for Israel on the grounds that it's the sole democracy in the Middle East if it's no longer a democracy. There's a point for me for because I'm in education that students are being terrorized uh, if they are saying something about Israel, and it 
these are American Jews. They are not representing Israel. And it is really unfair to the American Jewish students in college to be treated as if they were Israelis doing this. And I don't know how to stop that, how to yeah. help them. And I don't see anything in the PR in the United States that discusses this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I mean, J Jewish public opinion on campus is, is very, they're very divided. Many still support Israel, but increasing numbers are not. Uh, polls show there's a huge gap uh, between, I mean, there's just a big gap between generations in general. I actually, next to uh, LGBTQ issues, I don't know any political issue that parallels age as much as Israel-Palestine. The younger you are, the more sympathetic you are the Palestinian side, or at least more neutral. The older you are, the more you know, pro-Israel uh, uh, you are. You know, the among uh, uh, American Jews, that, that gap is even 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 bigger. And yeah, there's certainly some anti-Semitism that raises its ugly head in, in, in some uh, pro-Palestinian groups, but uh, um, you, you know, but but most of it, um, many of these stories and and uh, uh, that um, many of the, the the claims that these pro-Palestinian groups are harassing Jewish students or whatever, when they've investigated, found them really un unfounded. Um, there have been a bunch of lawsuits and the people have been have generally been cleared uh, of them. So we obviously need to challenge anti-Semitism, but where it's real, but let's not cry wolf by claiming that somehow supporting Palestinian rights is 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 hurting uh, Jewish students because uh, many Jewish students do not uh, um, identify with the Israeli government's policies at all. Okay, I, I can just real quick br briefly by. <clears throat> I've always, I've had uh, conflicts with my sister for as long as I can remember over this issue. But um, recently, and I had a, a conversation with her, and she has never, ever, to my, my, to my, to me anyway, been critical of Israel, no matter what Israel has done. And this time, she wouldn't stop talking about how she couldn't stand Netanyahu and doesn't understand how anybody could support him anyway i thought that was kind of interesting but what is what is your understanding of um public opinion in israel given this massive movement that's going on to defend uh certain democratic rights and defend the 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 power of the supreme court and so on is that is there an opening there is there do you, do you sense any shift in public opinion that might be possible for an opening for the palestinians and for more you know, socially justice, social justice orientation? I, I, I mean, Israel's clearly divided, and there are you know, large numbers of Israelis who are very upset. I mean, in terms of percentage of the population, it's one of the largest demonstrations in world history. Um, so there's a lot of opposition to um, uh, um, Netanyahu's policies. But basically, you know, they're, what they're trying to do is, is defend democracy for Israeli Jews. Um, and which is good. Obviously, you want you know you, you don't want democracy to be denied to Israeli Jews, but um, you know they they aren't really been addressing the the question of the occupation or the second class status of um, uh, Arab citizens of Israel. And uh, and and if if you need, if you look at the signs, if you look at the the rallying calls, if you look at the participants, uh, Palestinian issues unfortunately are not not very much part of it. Now. One could say, you know, by challenging uh, Netanyahu and getting people more mobilized politically, it could open a door down the road. But unfortunately, I haven't haven't seen much evidence of that so far. Okay, so here's another question: As more Americans forget about the atrocities of apartheid South Africa, does this reduce Americans' consciousness about the occupied and colonized Palestinians? Um. <clears throat> I, I think that um, I think any system, no matter what you call it, that discriminates people based on race and ethnicity is is going to be called out. I mean, I think it's seen as unacceptable. Um, I mean, the difference is, you know, obviously with uh, South African apartheid versus the Israeli apartheid, uh, but you know, no one's pretending that they're the same. I mean, apartheid is actually a broad term in international law, which definitely includes both. Remember, the South Africans didn't even call it apartheid for most of the time. They called it separate development. <laughs> um, but uh, the, um, I, 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 the, 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 the problem is, is that I think for many of us, for, many, for decades, we work for a two-state solution. 
is a Palestinian mini state alongside Israel. You know, just 22 percent of historic Palestine, but at least it would be something. Uh, and the Israeli colonization has made that impossible. So a lot of us who supported two-state solution for 40 years or more are saying, well, maybe it's too late. Maybe we do need to shift from an anti-occupation struggle to an anti-apartheid struggle to have a, uh, a single state where the rights of both, you know, uh, both peoples are guaranteed uh, and, and the like. Um, and I think that may be the direction that we, that we, that uh, things uh, things need to go. I do think it's important tactically to make a distinction between Israel and the occupied territories. But interesting how these anti BDS laws and a lot of other things, including a recent trade trade bill, you know, basically again redefined Israel as including Israel and the occupied territories. So if, so if uh, the U.S. And, and federal and state governments are, are starting to define all as Israel, you know. I think it's, it's it's legitimate to start you know questioning the the whole thing as uh, on the grounds of apartheid. Here's another question for you. Uh, there are many academics such as Salita and Finkelstein who have been targeted by Zionists for their work. Can you speak about your own experiences in this regard and what you would say to especially young academics who support Palestine? Well, you know, I've certainly been targeted, uh, and you know, by right-wing Zionist groups. I've had uh, um, speaking engagements uh, um, um, canceled. I've been allowed to speak only if I was balanced by a pro-Israel speaker. And again, you know, this is even back when I was really pushing for a two-state solution. I wasn't anti-Zionist. I was just talking about ending the occupation, but they defined pro-Israel as being pro-occupation. Um, so I've certainly experienced this. But let me tell you, I've also you know, been attacked uh, for my occupation, uh, uh, opposition to the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. When I arranged an event at USF back in 19, 1997, in opposition to the um, Indonesian occupation of East Timor, uh, the university lost a half million dollars in contributions because they failed to cancel the event. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are people who will... Um, and of course, you know, some of us here remember, you know, being claimed that we were communists, you know, because we opposed U.S. policy in Vietnam or Central America. I mean, I think, you know, if, if you take positions supporting peace and justice here, you're, you're going to be targeted. I think they, they get away with it a little more often regarding Israel and Palestine, um, in part because um, there are a lot of well-meaning liberals who um, you know take the position? Well, people in the target group um, should be the ones who know whether something is racist or sexist or what or, or anti-Semitic or whatever enough. And so, if these uh, Jewish people are saying the speaker is anti-Semitic, therefore they must be anti-Semitic. Who am I to judge? And you know they, they kind of they, they kind of go they they, they they you know so 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 when I when I look at things when I when I've been canceled or when I've been you know, had to be balanced or whatever, the people who made those decisions were not right wing. These were liberals who were somehow, you know, thinking that, you know, they were, you know, doing the right thing and on behalf of a targeted group. So that, that's what I, I, that's what I think gives this kind of thing more and more power. But, but it's now getting more and more legitimate to criticize uh, Israel. Indeed, you know, the, the recent events have shown that even mainstream Jewish organizations are being critical of the government now. So I think we're going to have, a, we're, I think I think uh, one thing that the recent protests in Israel have, have allowed is that it, it does give space, I think, for more uh, criticism uh, than we've had before. Thank you. Can you comment on the current state of Palestinian leadership? They seem to be sort of missing in action with all the crisis Seriously. developments um, in the country. Well, in the, in Gaza, of course, you have Hamas, a very reactionary group, which uh, grew grew and grew in support, um, not because Palestinians really like their hardline reactionary interpretation of Islam or or the the, the fact that their their mil their their armed wing is engaged in terrorism, but because the Palestinian Authority was seen as hopelessly corrupt and centrally being jailers in their own prison. Now, of course, in Gaza, the humanitarian situation is horrific. It's been under siege for many years. Um, with U.S. support, Israel has has, has heavily bombed uh, much of the the, the area's uh, uh, civilian infrastructure. Um, when uh, nonviolent activists from groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, Fellowship of Reconciliation, War Sisters International, American Friends Service Committee, tried to deliver uh, some um, 
food and construction supplies in this flotilla. Uh, the boats were boarded by uh, uh, Israel. Ten uh, passengers and crew were killed, and including in, uh, you know, five of whom, according to eyewitnesses and autopsy reports, were not resisting. One was a 19-year-old U.S. citizen who was shot for filming the raid and then shot in the back of the head while he lay wounded. And yet you had the majority of members of Congress sign a letter saying it was a legitimate self-defense um, and accusing these pacifist groups of, of, be, uh, of being associated with terrorists. Um, so Gaza has become a very, very difficult, um, a real tragic, tragic situation. And again, Hamas and their leadership, they've broken the back of the teachers union. They've suppressed other human rights groups. They've ended up being just as corrupt as the Palestine Authority. Uh, but, you know, people are desperate and under siege. And, and so people tend to uh, rally around the flag there. And the Palestine and, and, the, and the cities of the West Bank that are controlled by the Palestine Authority, um, you have a very aging leadership. Abbas is in his 90s right now. Uh, again, they, they are they are dependent on on basically on on foreign aid to to function. Um, you know, the Palestinian cities like Ramallah look relatively prosperous, but these are just islands surrounded by Israeli controlled uh, settlements and checkpoints and armed forces. It's Swiss cheese kind of situation, basically. Um, <clears throat> And uh, you know, and people are really uh, have kind of given up on them, even pretending a two-state solution is is is, po is possible. Um, there is active civil society uh, 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 resistance going on, nonviolent resistance. You have a few armed cells that are, are springing up, uh, both of them separate from both Hamas and the Palestine Authority. Um, but clearly, there's um uh, you know there's a, there's a bad need for uh, new leadership in the occupied territories. Okay, here's another question. It goes off in a slightly different direction. If uh, the U.S. decreases support for Israel, wouldn't that force Israel to turn to their other great sponsor, Russia? And there's well, more Russia hasn't been that. that so. Well, yeah, um, Russia hasn't been a big supporter of Israel uh, since uh, the early days of uh, Israel in the, in the Soviet Union. You know, initially saw uh, Israel as a more progressive alternative to the reactionary monarchies that, that then dominated the. Um, um middle east uh the um and then with the rise of arab nationalism they ended up making friends with the syrians and the egyptians and and the uh and the iraqis and and uh, uh libya and others and those uh you know all but syria have shifted sides <laughs> uh since then and um but um you know there doesn't that, that, that it, but israel has not uh, i mean there, there, there's certain you know ideological similarities with uh putin and netanyahu in terms of this kind of right-wing nationalism uh, uh, making alliance with with, with ultra conservative religious elements um indeed you could you know lump them together with or orban and 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 uh, hungary and modi and, and india and bolsonaro and brazil um I think that uh, you know, that uh, I, uh, I I I doubt that Russia that wants to make more uh, um, have more uh, influence in the Middle East would would risk that by cozying up to uh, to Israel. I think a lot of Israelis uh, would very much uh, oppose that, um, and that would totally lose their legitimacy in in the West. And and so I. And also, the military equipment is all U.S. made. It's not compatible with what Russia, the, the, the second-rate military equipment that Russia would offer. So I, I really don't see any risk of, of, of Israel going in that direction. Okay. There, Here, there are a number of questions oh. in the chat. Uh, oh, yeah. You keep, keep an eye on as, as, as well. Um, well, there's a question about um, the... Um, um, you know, what basically kind of what what can we do you know kinds of um of questions where there where is there hope um well, i think a couple things uh one is for those of you who are involved in you know groups like um progressive democrats of america or are part of some peace group like peace action that occasionally endorses candidates or whatever i think it's important to to say to them let's stop endorsing candidates who take a real hardline position in support of the occupation 
Uh, now, this is not say we shouldn't vote for the lesser evil. I believe in strategic voting. But as you know, a lot of these left liberal groups don't endorse every Democrat. They only endorse Democrats they feel, you know, given the limited amount of money and the limited amount of political clout, to a, to a certain number of the more progressive uh, uh, Democrats. Um, historically, though, many of these progressive groups have have, have supported you know, uh, candidates who take these really hardline positions um, in support of unconditional military aid or attacking the UN and this kind of thing, uh, defending Israeli war crimes, because, well, you know, you know, um, most Democrats do that, and APAC's so powerful and whatever, but that becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, that, you know, if, if one side is putting pressure and the other side isn't, of course, politicians are going to go where the pressure is. And so I think if we could try to get groups like PDA and and um, Peace Action and and others to say, no, if you support unconditional military aid to Israel, um, we're not going to endorse you. This is, we don't believe there's something like progressive except Palestine. Um, you know, this is that either you support human rights, international law, or you don't. And so I would, so, so I'd pressure a lot of liberal groups to make this a criteria for the endorsements. And also, I think really to put it in a, a human rights way. I, I don't, again, I don't think we should argue about Zionism because it has many diff different definitions, you know, and I think some of the more left-leaning Zionists who oppose the occupation can be our allies. And, and so I don't, I don't uh, and believe in getting all these arguments. But, I, but I think also I think we, think we should point out how, how Israeli U.S. support for Israel does not help Israelis. It is encouraging the most hardline elements, which are pursuing policies that have made, 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 made it impossible for there to be an Israel in the long term and, and, and ultimately make it less safe. Uh, for Israelis. I mean, actually, when you think about all the things that the, um, I mean, in many ways, it parallels historic anti-Semitism, you know, the way that in medieval Europe, they set up the Jews to be the money lenders or tax collectors and whatever. People would rise up against the Jew in return, in return for a degree of, all, of, of, of safety. But when people would rise up against their oppression, the ruling class would say, oh, it's not us, it's the Jews that are causing all your problems. And people have their pogroms, they turn on the Jews, Jews scatter to another country, the cycle starts all over again. And this went on for centuries, culminating, of course, in the Holocaust. And the idea of Zionism was if Jews could have their own nation state, they'd no longer be dependent on the whims of the ruling class. But ironically, and, and initially with Britain and France wanted to get rid of Nasser and all these other ways I've mentioned about Israel, U.S. using Israel to advance its hegemonic goals in the region. Uh, you know, Israel sort of being done to do the dirty work of the, of the United States. And when we wanted to curb Syrian influence in Lebanon, we encouraged the Israelis to, to, to invade in 2006. It was a disaster for Israel, but it was at the urging of the, um, of the Bush administration. And there are a whole bunch of other ways that I actually documented the United States has taken an even harder line than, than some Israeli governments vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. I mean, uh, and Israel at peace with its neighbors would not be uh, as good for U.S. arms industry and, and for U.S. hegemonic amb ambitions. I mean, this is divide and rule stuff. So I think we really need to um, focus on challenging, uh, the, the pointing out that U.S. support for the Israeli government is actually in the long term bad for Israelis as well, not just the Palestinians who are the more immediate victims. Thank you. Another question from the chat is, can you talk about how Israel woos city, state, and other local elected officials uh, and the political system overall? Well, I, I think um, certainly you know, uh, lobbyists have influence and they will, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they give people junkets to visit Israel and see the things that they, um, uh, they, they, they want to see. Um, they will get people to, you know, sign statements which seem innocuous and reasonable, and but in fact are, are it, uh, that it, depending on the reading, they take some pretty hardline positions. I think it's just like any other kind of um of um. <clears throat> and again, people use the kind of guilt tripping around uh, you know anti-Semitism and the like. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of these kinds of uh, kinds of tactics, but but ultimately, I think the politicians are the ones who are responsible. You know, uh, I, I don't, I mean, we we, uh, we can complain about the National Rifle Association, but I focus on the politicians who sell out to them. 
you know, because there are plenty of politicians who say no to the NRA. And if a, if a, Demo if a Democrat could say no to the NRA, if the Democrat can say no to the oil companies around climate legislation, I mean, there are plenty of lobbies that are at least as powerful as APAC that uh, Democrats are, and, are, are, are local officials, state officials, or national officials are able to say no to. They could do it as uh, uh, about APAC and their allied uh, lobbying groups as well. Um, but I think we need to, uh, you know, again, need to, to apply a, um, um, apply a pressure in the other direction. Okay, I have a, a very specific question here uh, from someone. Last week, uh, I saw a large billboard here in San Francisco that supports Jews in Israel and criticizes anti-Semitism. Do you know where this may have come from? Oh yeah, there's there there's a group. Um, I forget. I mean, I, 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 there's there's a number of groups. Uh, some of them have pretty innocuous names that have been setting up billboard, you know, campaigns saying that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. You know, implying that uh, if you if you don't support uh, the Israeli government, you're part of some some nasty anti-Semitic uh, kind of uh, kind of thing. Um, but um, again, we you know, uh, I I um. I don't know the specifics of this of this particular group. Okay, here's another one um, referring to the Oslo uh, Accords some years ago. Excellent review of Israel's abuses. However, no mention of the Oslo failure. Do you see future negotiations to correct the Oslo Accords? Well, the um, <clears throat> Israeli government has effectively renounced the Oslo Accords. Um, and you know it's interesting. The the again the U.S. has uh, um, has conditioned in communication or aid or anything to Palestinian Authority in the grounds that they continue to support the Oslo Accords and all the subsequent agreements, but they don't require the same of Israel. Yeah. I mean, Oslo was kind of a trap. It ends up. I mean, the idea was that if the Palestinians got more land and more rights, it would. Israel would relax and give them more land and more rights, and that would curb uh, Palestinian militancy, which would give Israel more conf uh, confidence. And it's supposed to be a you know positive feedback loop, uh, but because under Clinton uh, the U.S. actually supported Israel in its its colonization efforts and to divide up the West Bank to make a viable independent Palestinian state uh, virtually impossible. That uh, you know, basically, the the U.S. position was that expanding settlement, things like expanding settlements, control of Jerusalem, whether there should be a Palestinian state, should be for the final status issues. Uh, but this allowed, but by, by Israel refusing to compromise and Israel to keep colonizing, it made new facts on the ground. And so, when Clinton came with these proposals in 2000 at Camp David, uh, which would have given Palestinians an independent state, and this is supported by Barack, the um, Israeli Prime Minister, but divide the West Bank into four non-contiguous cantons surrounded by Israel, with Israel control of the airspace, the water resources, and everything else. And, and Arafat quite reasonably saying, no, this is far short of what we need for a viable state. I'm willing to recognize Israel. I'm willing to curb these militant groups. I'm willing to do all these things, but we need a viable state, not this uh, thing that uh, Barack and, and, and Clinton uh, drove, uh, uh, drew up. Uh, but uh, when when uh, Arafat refused to to, to go with this, um, Clinton ended up blaming Arafat. Nancy Pelosi blamed Arafat. You know, you know editorial opinion blamed Arafat. <laughs> um, so you know it was um, uh, so, you know so there's this myth that the U.S. it was it was the Palestinians that that uh, wouldn't let Oslo go through, but but the but again the Israelis the Israelis who are violating it by not freezing the settlements as promised. And um, again, making it impossible, uh, you know, given that they refuse to leave the settlements as the UN has called for, uh, to, to make any kind of, uh, you know, of, of, of a viable, uh, you know, Palestinian state. And again, the U.S. The, the Democratic Party doesn't even even say anything about the settlements or or, or, or occupation in their platform because they 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 basically insist that it's all Palestinians' fault. <laughs> Thank you. This has really been very informative. I've learned a lot here. Um, I, there's one more question, maybe a couple more questions, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. But 
um, recur regarding the current crisis uh, in Israel, wh why do Netanyahu and his allies want to eliminate the influence of the, the Israeli Supreme Court? Well, the first one, one is to get keep uh, um, Netanyahu out of jail, uh, which he's almost certainly going to go to um, if um, you know, if uh, the, the court cases around him were allowed to uh, proceed. Uh, but the, the Israeli Supreme Court has allowed, you know, has stopped some excessive uh, government actions and discriminating against Palestinian citizens of Israel or or or, um, uh, or Palestinians in the West Bank. Has involved at least some checks, um, and also it's it's prevented uh, sort of uh, some of these ultra religious uh, Orthodox uh, groups uh, from imposing some of the more theocratic uh, demands on the Israeli population as a whole. Uh, so, you know, essentially you have, have kept some, you know, the, you know, what the, the, the equivalent of the separation of church and state. Um, and so, you know, so, so basically this is a way of consolidating, uh, wanting to consolidate power and create kind of a unitary executive and essentially an authoritarian, authoritarian government where there are no checks and balances. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Zunas. Uh, it's been an amazing presentation today. And I and, and then let, let me say I I, I have a um um I, ha I have an email list uh, to which I send my uh, periodic um uh, articles. Um, and you can also ac access my website. It hasn't been up updated in uh, about six or eight months, but uh, does have some articles on mine and putting both my email address for which you can write me to sign up for my email list. I only send out stuff maybe once a month, you know, short policy briefs, mostly, uh, mostly on the Middle East, uh, not exclusively. And again, there's my uh, um, web addresses as, as well, if you want to see some of my uh, posted articles and interviews and the like. We'll uh, send out Professor Zoom's email uh, information through the Human Rights Working Group. So if you're subscribed to us, and I hope you are, we'll send that out so you can be on his list. I also just and put it in the chat as well if people want to check check now. It's in the chat for those of you online as well. We have a sign-up sheet at the, at the door. If you haven't signed it, please do. That is one way we can keep in touch with you. And in way of closing, I'd like to mention that if you are interested in this issue of Israel and Palestine, we have a new group called UUs for Justice in the Middle East, Bay Area Chapter. This is a national organization. Some of you may already know about them and be on their mailing list, but we've started a local chapter. We'll be having a meeting on the 19th of this month in the 7 in the evening, probably right here at church, but also on Zoom. So uh, I'd encourage you, I'd beg you to get involved. Let's do something about this because we can make a difference on this issue. And it's really important that each of us do something, I think. I'd like to also mention that uh, we are we don't have a forum the next two Sundays, but in uh, the 23rd, we have this forum on book bans that I mentioned at the beginning. And then the weekend after that, we have uh, the Answer Coalition, Peter Becker speaking, sorry, Tim Redmond, Tim Redmond, I'm sorry, from uh, 48 Hills will be speaking. Okay, and then finally, Bruce. I just want to announce a, a demonstration that's taking place today at two o'clock. And the slogans for this demonstration are no U.S. NATO war with Russia, stop U.S. threats against China, no World War III. It's the system, not humanity, that needs to become extinct. <laughs> and um, this, it's, the rally is going to begin at Palin Market at 2 p.m., so you're all invited to be part of that. And I think that's about it, isn't it, Jeff? Okay. Uh, thank everybody. Thank you. And there were a lot of people on Zoom, uh, a lot of people here. So we're really gratified that people, you know, came and and I think this this presentation was extremely important. And and I'm we're grateful for you, um, Professor Zunis, for being here. So that's it. Um, thank you.